Hello and welcome to this clip on limiting reagent. We'll take you through what a limiting reagent is and the idea of excess amount in a chemical reaction, uh, as well as going on to talk about why it's important to know the limiting reagent in a chemical reaction, before going on to some simple worked examples. And it's assumed at this point that you're already comfortable with the idea of using balanced chemical equations to work out mole ratios. So if we step away from chemistry for a moment and look at the components that make up a burger, here's what we have. So we basically have a bun, some cheese, some lettuce, and a burger of some description. So if we now have um, a random set of those ingredients, um, they're not necessarily matched to each other, we have to try and work out how many complete burgers we can make. So what we've got to do is count up the amount of everything. We have four buns. We've got six cheese slices, three lettuce portions, and five burgers. So if you look very closely, you can see, obviously, that you can only really make three burgers. Why is that? Because your limiting um, reagent in this particular case is the lettuce. You only have three samples of lettuce, three portions of lettuce, so therefore you can make three burgers. Which means the other three ingredients will be slightly in excess, some more than others. OK, so it's not chemistry, but at least it gets us thinking about the idea of proportions. So we now have a look at a chemistry example. So if we use this diagram as our model, obviously what's happening is hydrogen and oxygen are reacting. So something like that equation would probably be a reasonable representation of what's going on. But if we have a quick look at the equation, you can see the mole ratio. And quite clearly, it's a 2 to 1 ratio. So if you have 10 moles of hydrogen, and you react it with 7 moles of oxygen gas, the oxygen isn't going to be completely used up. Here's the reason why. It's because 10 moles of hydrogen gas only needs 5 moles of oxygen gas to make 10 moles of H2O. So therefore we can work out what's in excess. It's clearly going to be the oxygen gas. So therefore we can also work out what the limiting reagent is. So it will obviously be the hydrogen. Because if you look at the equation very carefully, you'll see that all of the hydrogen has been used up. So as soon as the hydrogen has been used up, there's still two moles of oxygen gas left that are unreacted. You can see it from the diagram at the top of the screen as well. So therefore, the reaction which is used up first is called the limiting reagent. And whatever is left behind afterwards, which is remaining partially reacted, is called um, in excess. So let's have a look at this example and try and work out what's in excess. If we assume that we start with 2 moles of CH4 and uh, 3 moles of oxygen. Looking at the stoichiometry or the mole ratios in the balanced equation, it's clear that uh, for every 1 mole of CH4, you require 2 moles of oxygen. So therefore, if you need uh, to burn 2 moles of CH4, like the example suggests, that means you'd need 4 moles 
of oxygen. So in this example, where we only have three moles of oxygen, we're one mole short, so therefore the O2 is the limiting reagent. So therefore methane is in excess in this particular case. So let's look at another example. Let's try and work out what's in excess and what's the limiting reagent here. So if we work it out for magnesium oxide, we've got 0 0.563 moles. So if we do the same for hydrogen sulfide, you'll see that we get a slightly different amount. It's actually slightly less, isn't it? It's almost enough, but not quite. Now, bearing in mind the mole ratio of magnesium oxide to hydrogen sulfide in this reaction is 1 to 1, it's reasonable to assume that 0 0.563 moles of magnesium oxide would also require 0 0.563 moles of hydrogen sulfide for a complete reaction. So the amount of H2S present, which is 0 0.525 moles, is less than the amount of H2S needed, which is 0 0.563 moles. So therefore, H2S is the limiting reagent, and the magnesium oxide is in excess. So let's have a look at some practice examples. Um, it asks us to work out which of the reagents is the limiting reagent, what's the maximum amount of each product that can be formed, and how much of the other, other reagent is left over in excess after the reaction is complete. So let's do the first one. So if we first start by working out the moles for our two reagents, you can see you've got 0.375 moles of sodium, uh, sorry, ammonium nitrate and uh, 0.305 moles of sodium phosphate. If you look carefully at the equation, you'll see that there's 3 moles of ammonium nitrate for every 1 mole of sodium phosphate. So the next thing you have to do is compare the moles present with the moles needed the moles needed will be, t will be revealed by the equation. So if we bring the page down a little bit, we can do that. So using the 3 to 1 mole ratio that we've just spotted, it's quite obvious that uh, we have not enough NH4NO3 by quite a large amount. We need 0 0.915 moles of it. We only have 0 0.375 moles of it. So it must be that NH4NO3, ammonium nitrate, is the limiting reagent in this case. So I'm just going to clear my writing off the screen and just write down the stuff that actually answers the question so that we can then continue with the next, the next question that you can start to see at the bottom of the screen now. So taking NH4NO3 to be our limiting reagent and the fact that we only have 0 0.375 moles of it present then we have to work with that. That is all that's going to be able to react because it doesn't matter how much Na3PO4 we've got, if it's limited by the certain amount of NH4NO3 that we have, then we have to assume that that is all that will react. So what we're doing here in part B is looking at the mole ratio between ammonium nitrate on the left-hand side and the products on the right-hand side. So if we take the mole ratio of ammonium nitrate to ammonium phosphate, first of all, you can see from the um, equation that it's a 3 to 1 mole ratio, hence why I divided 0 0.375 by 3, which you can now see annotated on the equation. If we look at the number of moles of ammonium nitrate to the number of moles of sodium nitrate, it's 3 moles to 3 moles, hence why it's a 1 to 1 mole ratio which is why I put 0 0.375 moles as my second answer for part B. So now all we have to do is work out how much of the other reagent is left over. So I'm going to clear my writing again one more time. And we revisit the mole calculations we did a couple of minutes ago. 
we now know how many moles of every uh, of each one of the reagents that we've got. So we can work out the excess Na3PO4. Uh, so the question this poses is how much Na3PO4 will our 0 0.375 mo sorry, moles of NH4NO3 actually react with? So seeing as it's a 3 to 1 mole ratio, you divide your 0 0.375 by 3, which actually now means that 0 0.375 moles of ammonium nitrate will react completely with 0 0.125 moles of sodium phosphate, which leads us on to working out how much sodium phosphate is left. Well, what we need to do is take how much we actually have and subtract from that the amount we actually reacted, which gives us 0 0.180 moles. Let's try one more example. So I've transcribed the three questions onto this screen so we don't have to keep flicking back and forth. OK, so let's start with our calcium carbonate, shall we? So starting with calcium carbonate, notice I'd used 100.1, not 100. I didn't round down. I used the actual atomic mass values that were in the, um, the periodic table. So that gives me 0 0.999 moles in 100 grams of calcium carbonate. So I've done the same with my iron phosphate, and uh, I've got 0 0.298 moles of iron phosphate present. So using the mole ratio, I take my moles of calcium carbonate, I divide them by 3, then multiply that figure by 2, uh, which takes into account the 3 to 2 mole ratio in the uh, stoichiometric equation, which means that the amount of moles of iron 3 phosphate that I need is 0 0.666. Obviously the amount that I've got, which is 0 0.298, is quite considerably short of this. So iron 3 phosphate is the limiting reagent. So in the next question, where it asks for the maximum amount of each product, that's obviously now going to be determined by the amount of iron phosphate we've got available. So we start by looking at the mole ratios of iron phosphate to calcium phosphate. So obviously the number of moles of calcium phosphate that we get is half the number of moles of iron phosphate that we have. So our theoretical maximum amount of calcium phosphate will be 0 0.149 moles. And because the number of moles of iron carbonate is also 1 mole to iron phosphate's 2 moles, it's the same answer for this particular product as well. So the maximum amount of each product in moles is going to be 0 0.149. Now they didn't say in the question whether they want it in grams or not. Um, if they wanted to do conversion to grams... Uh, you would obviously need to do a uh, rearrangement of moles equals mass over MR, and you get slightly different masses of each compound, because obviously the MR of each of those two products are going to be different from one another. So the final job to do is to work out how much our um, calcium carbonate is in excess by. So the first thing we have to do is work out how much calcium carbonate was actually used up by our limiting amount of iron phosphate. The mole ratio of iron phosphate to calcium carbonate is 2 to 1, so what you've got to do is scale it up. So you take your 0 0.298 moles of iron phosphate that we have got, and you multiply it by 1.5, and, and that gives you 0 0.447 moles of calcium carbonate that's actually used up. So to do that, you take the amount of calcium carbonate that you had to start with, which was 0 0.999, and you subtract from that the amount of it that we've just calculated was actually used up, which leaves us with 0 0.552 moles in excess. So if we now have a look at the mark scheme. So you can see clearly here that they've actually put the answer in grams, so we'll do a quick check to see if the moles that we've worked out actually end up with those grams. So before we do any calculations, we can tick off our ammonium nitrate and our iron 3 phosphate because we work them out with limiting reagents. So if we take our value and we multiply it by 146, which is the, um, 
the molar mass of NH4-3PO4. That gives us 18.25 grams. Slightly different to what they got, because this worksheet may not be using exactly the same um, periodic table that we're using, and I may have done a little bit of rounding through my calculation rather than keeping with the, the calculator values. But it's close enough. Let's now try it for sodium nitrate. It's a bit closer this time, at 31.875 grams. I'm just going to scrub those two out and do the final one, which is sodium phosphate. And again, we get quite a close answer, 29.52 grams. So let's bring the screen down a bit and do the same for number two. So our first one seems fine, close enough to what they wanted. Let's do the next one, iron 3 carbonate. This time we got 43.45. It may have been a little bit of over-enthusiastic rounding on my part during the course of the calculation. But again, it's not exactly a million miles away. It's fairly close. And obviously, I'm hoping you would have spotted my slight error. It was not a deliberate error. It was a genuine mistake. But when I was calculating the mass of calcium phosphate, I shouldn't have called it 0 0.149 grams. I should have really called it 0 0.149 moles. So, sorry about that. So now, let's have a look at calcium carbonate as our final one. This time, still reasonably close, but getting a little bit further away from their ideal answer of 54.0 grams. So the possible reason for this might be different um, relative atomic mass values, depending on where this worksheet came from and what periodic table they used. I may have over-rounded at some point, uh, or they may have over-rounded. Uh, they haven't showed me their workings, so it's possible that they might have over-rounded at some point in their calculations. But the, the main thing is that hopefully you can see the importance now of the, the idea of limiting reagent and why it's important to be able to work out by how much something is in excess, for example. This is quite a common reacting quantities calculation. It's slightly more challenging than normal, which is why it's taken a little bit of time to work our way through it. But hopefully the clip has been reasonably useful. And if you have any queries or questions, jot them down and bring them in and have a chat to one of us or maybe go and see your teacher or pop into a subject extension. But for now, thanks for your patience and see you soon.